thank you for, for spending some time with us uh, this morning. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, got in uh, early this morning from San Francisco and uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit of marketing. I'm gonna try to keep it minimal. Um, but just to, to let you all know what we see with our customers, um, some of the things we've been hearing um, in the market and how we're approaching the market today. But my guess is that how many of you, uh, before you got here, heard of a company called VMware? A show of hands. How, how many of you uh, knew that there was something called Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization before you got here? Well, actually, that's, that's a lot higher than we usually see. Um, a friend of mine at Microsoft said that Rev is the best kept secret in virtualization today. Um, and uh, we're working to change that one event at a time. Um, but uh, I'll spend some time on what Rev is um, and some of the benefits in terms of performance, scalability, the actual architecture of the product. Um, talk about how some companies today are actually using uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. And then talk a little bit about what's coming up in the next version. Um, we have 3.0 on the market, as Claude mentioned. And uh, towards the end of the year, we'll be releasing a, a 3.1. Um, a product we're very excited about. So, um, you know, the 800 pound gorilla in the room is that VMware is the ubiquitous uh, virtualization company. And they've reached that vaunted position in the market where it's a very safe bet to go with VMware. Um, but just like other occupants of this storied position in the market, um, we've also seen um, as they've become more successful and more entrenched and really have created the market that there's now opportunities and actually companies are looking towards alternatives. They don't want to be locked into a single vendor. Um, we we uh, did our own research through IDG, but other Gar uh, analysts like Gartner and IDC have reported similar findings that while still the minority of folks are, are dual sourcing their virtualization, most over 70% within the next 12 to 18 months plan to implement multiple hypervisor technologies. And you know, a lot of folks see these numbers and they say, well, yeah, maybe on the margins, but I like the standardization. I can train my people once and I have one platform to work with and um, I don't you know, really see the, the point of introducing more options into, the, in, into my data center. But when you ask folks what they are virtualizing for today, um, it's still, um, you know, there's, there's some folks who are doing cloud-based solutions, but again, I think everybody sort of has a toe in the water. Um, they're just trying those things out. But what's really still driving virtualization is cost reduction, whether it's just straight server consolidation, um, but it could be disaster recovery and business continuity, um, more manageability, being able to deploy more, faster, cheaper, and more responsively. And analysts that, that we talk to um, and the press have really, over the last year or so, uh, begun to realize that while VMware had a very substantial lead in this space for a very long time, um, that that's really changing. So uh, with the release of Rev, certainly with the release of Hyper-V 2012 on the Windows side, there's a real sense that now there are options and people should at least be looking at those options. Um, you know, InfoWorld did a shootout of our previous product 2.2 with um, vSphere, I think it was four at the time, um, and Rev scored second ahead of where Citrix and Hyper-V were. Uh, we're trying to get them to, to redo those results because we're, we're interested just like anybody else. But, you know, the consensus is that um, again, that, that now, is, now is the time to be looking at alternatives. And while Microsoft, I think, has a really good position in terms of capturing a lot of Windows workloads, if, if you're like most of our customers, uh, most, of, uh, um, most of our partners' customers who are virtualizing Linux, um, I think it makes a lot more sense to do that on Rev. Um, you know, again, what we bring to the table is not just open source technology. It's, you know, open source technology, it's freely downloadable. You can go to a website, you can get it. What Red Hat offers in that, in this space is the commercialization of open source. So we take the best 
of the open source technologies. We harden it, we test it, we work with our partners like IBM and HP and others to certify it to their platforms, make sure it works. And then we redistribute all those changes that we make back to the community so they can continue to build on it. Um, sort of a late breaking announcement last week in uh, the UK, um, Rev received a uh, Tech World Award for best virtualization product, um, something we're very happy about. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Tech World, it's mostly a European um, uh, uh, publication, but they really concentrate on real world solutions. Um, you know, our marketing didn't dazzle them. We didn't write them a nice big check. Um, they, you know, they, they talked to their readership. They had a panel of experts. And you know, Rev was one of the first really compelling solutions that, that they'd seen in the market for a long time, whether it's open source or not. Um, and so um, there'll be more about this um, coming up on our, I'm sure, uh, from our PR folks and our marketing folks. But um, again, um, this is kind of where we are in the market. So what is Rev? So Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, really long name. Uh, we usually shorten it down to one syllable, Rev. Um, but in a nutshell, we have a Rev manager that kind of manages all of the hypervisors. We have a Rev hypervisor, which is built on KVM, um, which is an open source hypervisor technology. And I'll get to that in a moment. And then we have our, our management engine. So if you're more familiar with, v with VMware, Rev manager is kind of like the vCenter server. Uh, the Rev H or the Rev hypervisor is analogous to ESXi. It's a single purpose built version of Linux that just hosts virtual machines. So we take advantage of the fact that Linux is extremely modular so we can get this down to 100 megs of, of code on disk, um, single purpose built um, and, and low security footprint um, for just managing virtual machines. And then if you're familiar with vSphere, if you want certain features, you need a certain edition. Um, we have a single edition. Um, and the only difference is whether you want business hour support or 24 by 7. So you know, what we offer to, um, to our customers and, and to hopefully you in the room um, is an alternative to VMware, especially for your Linux workloads. So server consolidation, hardware abstraction, those are the, the table stakes. Um, we see a lot of folks who are using this in their Unix to Linux migrations. Um, so if you're moving off of Solaris and looking for an, an x86 alternative, on the Solaris side, on the power side, you may have been using LPARs or containers and other types of technologies that allow you virtualization-like benefits. Um, so we have customers who are just folding this into their, their migration paths. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our monster VMs, which are bigger than their monster VMs. but. Um, Again, a lot of the underpinnings of our virtualization solution is what allows you to get great performance on your Linux workloads as well. I show this just to kind of give you a sense of how long the technology has been percolating in the open source community and how long Red Hat's been working on commercializing it. Um, KVM, as an alternative to the Zen hypervisor, uh, was released to open source in December of 06, and it was accepted into the mainstream Linux kernel a month later. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with uh, Linux and how, how picky they are about things they let into the kernel, this almost never happens. Um, certainly, uh, a technology that's released to the open source usually has to bang around for a while before it gets accepted into the Linux kernel, because that means that anything going forward has to support that technology. And KVM was able to do that because it directly leverages Linux to do all of the CPU scheduling, the memory management, the hardware enablement. It's a natural fit with, with what Linux does anyway, taking a general purpose operating system and enabling it for virtualization. Um, as, as Claude mentioned, uh, we acquired a company called Kubernet, uh, which had developed KVM and a management system. Um, they released a product in 07. We released the first version of Rev in 2009. Um, a couple of releases later in uh, January of 2012, we released Rev 3.0. Um, and a couple of things we've done since then involving the, uh, the open source community, I'll get to in a second. But we have thousands of customers who are in deployment today. Um, Simcore uh, is, is one of the, the major ones. Qualcomm, which is probably even VMware's largest 
North America um, uh, customer. And most of our customers are also using VMware. So we're not doing rip and replaces, um, at least not yet. Um, we're, we're kind of seeing the same kind of adoption patterns that we did when, our, when Unix customers started turning to Linux. They found workloads that, that they could peel off, get the, the, the cost benefits and the agility benefits of moving to open source where the costs were cheaper, where the technology was good enough to get to where they wanted to go, and then slowly they moved to you know, today where we have mostly Linux shops instead of mostly Unix shops. So Rev has two parts. One's the hypervisor and one's the management system. So uh, KVM is the heart of what we do in virtualization. And this, this diagram shows a little bit here. KVM is a kernel loadable module in Linux, which means it's, it's a driver. You can literally install it and start it without rebo rebooting the computer. And now your, your Linux kernel can handle scheduling virtual machines the same way it does Apache and Postgres and other applications. Um, the, because it's integrated into Linux, it actually inherits all of the capabilities that we have in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So um, unlike Zen, for example, uh, Zen has its own kernel for the hypervisor. So you rip out the Linux kernel, you replace it with a Zen kernel and then you can host virtual machines, but the technologies don't always translate. It's built on open source, but um, for example, when the Helium technology from Intel was first released, it took nearly six months to enable that fully in Zen because the architectural changes were not trivial, and there's a much smaller community working on the Zen kernel than there is on the Linux kernel. So KVM was ready for Nihilum as soon as Nihilum technology was released. Zen lagged a few months. Um, because it couldn't directly leverage everything that we do to enable HP, IBM hardware to work with, with Linux and therefore KVM. We inherit the same host scalability limits. So in the current version, we can handle 160 logical CPUs or threads. So with hyper-threading turned on, that's an eight socket machine with 10 cores and hyper-threading. It's probably about as big as you'll get. Um, but we are architected to handle up to 4,000 of those threads. Uh, two terabytes of RAM is what we currently um, certify, but again, uh, Rev3 is, is architected to handle 64 terabytes. On the guest, today we support 64 virtual CPUs and 512 gigs of RAM. Um, in the 3.1 release, which I, I'll talk about towards the end, we'll actually be able to handle 160 virtual CPUs and two terabytes of RAM in a guest. Um, some people ask, that's kind of ginormous, why would you ever do that? Um, one reason is, again, you can, get, you can guarantee that anything you put on bare metal today, you'll be able to virtualize fully. Um, so you could take your eight socket, 10 core, with hyper-threading turned on Linux box that you buy brand new today, and in future, you know you'll be able to virtualize it and run it on KVM, because today we can handle virtualizing that box. So certainly in two years when we have 20 cores and a, and a chip and whatever amount of RAM we have, you'll be able to virtualize those. On the management side, uh, you'll notice this is not the usual Linux uh, white text on a black background GUI. This is an actual web interface. Uh, we've made it fairly straightforward for folks who are used to vCenter. Um, designed for 500 plus hosts, 10,000 plus virtual machines. Um, this is a graphical user interface um, that you use, but you also have a RESTful API. Um, and we'll talk about the future. We'll also have a Linux command line interface and uh, um, some SDKs that help if you want to do uh, scripting. The features of Rev Manager today, um, live migration or our version of vMotion is built into the product. A high availability, the same definition that VMware has. If you lose a host, um, anything that's marked as highly available will restart somewhere else in the cluster. And our clusters can be up to 200 machines rather than 32 or 64 machines that you see in our competitors. Uh, we have the same kind of system scheduling, load balancing, power saving, image management through templates, thin provisioning. We use QCOW or Q QMU copy on write as our, as our uh, thin provisioning technology, um, snapshotting. Um, so 
all of the features that our customers use today. We'll talk a little bit about futures. Today we don't have storage vMotion. Um, that's probably the, the one big gap that we're looking to close with the next release. Um, and currently the Rev 3.0 is English only in the GUI, um, but the re release that's coming at the end of the year will be international, including French. And then finally, um, you know, in terms of ecosystem, um, we have partners today like vKernel, like Manage IQ, Acronis, others that integrate through the Rev API. Uh, we're announcing more and more of these every day. Um, we have a lot of customers who are using Rev for virtual desktops, and that's a technology that's built into our product. Um, but you know, there are other key technologies that surround virtualization. Um, we're working with partners who work with VMware, but also work with Rev and with Hyper-V and with other platforms um, to provide additional services like capacity and performance management, backups, and that sort of thing. And then finally, um, we have the concept built into Rev, so it's not an add-on um, subscription or an add-on uh, license of a user portal. So um, we have a, a user interface that's tied directly into LDAP or Active Directory. Um, as an administrator, I can give um, very granular role and object-based permissions to my users or to groups. So I can take my developer group and give them a cluster in my Rev environment and give them full access to create and destroy whatever they want. I can limit them to only creating machines off of templates and maybe just give them access to the Linux templates and not the Windows templates or vice versa. And I can drill it down to just giving them permission to turn on or turn off a single virtual machine. So both roles, permissions, grouped in objects. Um, and this is a really nice feature, again, for test dev, for, um, for VDI. I mean, we use this as our desktop connection broker as well. Um, this is part of the value that we offer to customers as part of the subscription. It's not a different addition or a different product. So some of the advantages of Rev, um, we're mentioning before some of the, some of the architecture on uh, KVM and, and how we emulate virtual machines. Um, but I wanted to point out um, some just some raw performance scores. Um, this is something um, spec.org, which is an independent benchmarking company, um, puts together uh, spec JBB or spec web um, for performance characterizing. They came out in 2010 with something called spec vert. Um, Red Hat, VMware, Microsoft, Citrix were all part of the committee that created the standard. Um, and as of today, um, there's been roughly 30 published scores on, on SpecVert um, by Red Hat and by VMware. And as of today, um, Red Hat owns the top two socket scores, the top four socket scores, and has the only published eight socket scores. Now with any benchmark, you can run the benchmark and choose not to publish your results, and generally you would choose not to if you didn't get the highest score. Um, so I know that we don't have at Red Hat some magical ability to get hold of eight socket servers that VMware doesn't have. So I can only guess why there are no um, eight socket scores for VMware, but leave, it, leave that as it, as it will. Um, we have great overall performance. Um, this is a sort of a synthetic application stack where you have tiles of six virtual machines. One is running a web server, one's running a database, one is running a uh, a mail server, one is running an application middleware layer, one is running uh, a user space program, and one is idle. And you keep adding these stacks to the, to the single host until the next one you add either plateaus the score or causes a performance dip, and then you roll back to the last one. So, you know, the scores are the raw throughput of a single hypervisor based on all of these virtual machines being on this. The top score at the right on an eight socket server uh, represents 552 VMs running on a single server that are contributing performance. So these aren't just 1,000 or 500 idle servers. These are 550 servers that are actually adding to the performance of the box. Then in terms of cost, um, 
Like I said, Red Dead Enterprise Virtualization has a single edition, so we don't have tiered editions in terms of what features. All the features I've talked about are included in the product. Um, when we release 3.1, we're going to be throwing in more features and keeping it the same. Um, our cost is on a subscription model, um, so there's no upfront license fee. You pay a fee each year. Um, it's five, 500 US dollars is the list price for uh, business hour support per socket. So no VRAM, no additions. So if you want business hour support, it's $500 per socket. If you want 24 by 7, it's $750 per socket. Um, and that's what you pay each year. So if we look at the cost in the first year between Rev and vSphere 5, and we compare ourselves to the Enterprise Edition on vSphere 5, um, this is for 20 sockets, essentially. Um, our upfront cost is much less because we don't have that license fee in the first year. So uh, $10,000 for, for Rev for those uh, 20 sockets in a uh, business hour support um, uh, scenario versus 70000 for vSphere 5 for the sockets. It's maybe fairer to compare over three years um, since we don't have that, that high upfront cost. In the three-year period, we're still 30K versus almost 90K for, um, for vSphere. Um, before VMware got rid of VRAM, those numbers could be even scarier. Um, but I'm still happy with, with the cost comparison here. Um, but you know, what that means to our customers, not just necessarily that we're cheaper, um, but it means that we have a higher ROI um, for the same project. You get to your break even faster. So for a lot of our larger customers, either on the government side um, or in, in larger uh, organizations, they may have to get to a break even point on their previous project before they can do the next project. And certainly, you know, it's not just a few percentage points off of the top of, of the cost of the virtualization software. It's actually quite a lot in terms of the overall budget. So it can actually change some of the economics for our customers. We've had um, um, you know, folks like uh, um, in the public sector um, in the United States who have told us that um, for the cost of the VMware licensing alone, they got the rev licensing, they bought the hardware and the consulting to put the project together. So it's, again, it's, it can be quite compelling for, for those of you who are looking to, to move fast and to, to respond to your uh, to your customers' needs. We can also talk about value in terms of cost for performance. So the great thing about these spec scores is that we know how many sockets and the configuration of all the boxes. And we know how much it costs because we can count sockets and we can multiply them by licensing costs. So we did a little bit of analysis where we took all those published scores and we figured out how much it would cost on VMware versus Red Hat. And then we divided the licensing cost over three years by the performance score. So we got a dollar per unit of performance. So you know, the net here is that over a three year period, which is generally how we do the comparisons between our subscription model and the, uh, the proprietary model, um, VMware is $7 for a unit of performance. That same unit of performance with Red Hat uh, is $2.50. So again, if you're looking for you know, things be, that, that help characterize the, the value here, you, know, you can see over time, um, you know, VMware wins a couple and we win a couple, but overall we're, we're all kind of about the same in terms of performance. I like the fact that the current top scores are us, but tomorrow they might be VMware, but we're all within a certain amount of, of each other because we're all hitting that bare metal threshold. But the value is something that really puts us apart. Um, from, from the competition there. So I wanted to talk about a couple of use cases very quickly to start, kind of bring um, some, some reality and, and some, some real world uh, examples. Um, these are all public case studies uh, downloadable from our website. Um, DreamWorks is one of our biggest customers um, and we do a lot of work with them on the bare metal, um, a lot of uh, the animated movies like Shrek are done on Red Hat Enterprise Linux on the bare metal scheduled with our, our grid applications. Um, but they also, like a lot of other businesses, have 
you know, mundane stuff like their Oracle financials and their Oracle databases. Um, well, mundane, but mission critical. So um, they were moving from, from a place of lots of bare metal apps, both on, both on Windows and Linux, to support their financial back, uh, back office uh, requirements. Um, they had looked at, at VMware. Yes. Does Oracle support anyone's virtualization but their own? Technically, no. Um, you know, so uh, we work with our customers to ensure that, that those Oracle workloads work. Uh, recently, we got certification um, mainly because we have such a large customer community that they demanded it from Oracle for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6. That took a bit longer than it should have, um, but it came through. Um, so, so the important part in terms of the uh, support matrix is, is the operating system supported first, and RHEL 5 and RHEL 6 are both supported. On the virtualization side, um, Oracle has a bunch of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, um, on, or FUD. Um, they insist that the only virtualization they will support is Oracle VM. So most people will, will at least try Oracle VM once and then run screaming from it. Um, and then they'll end up with some other platform. Um, the management of that is, 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 a, is a dance. Um, we have some technologies that allow us to, um, to mitigate those risks. For example, um, we can do uh, with our partner Acronis, um, we can do V2Ps. So if your database is stored on NFS or in the version 3.1, which is coming out towards the end of the year, if it's stored on an external LUN and just your VM is, is, has the Oracle applications, if you run into the problem on the virtualization, you can quickly take that VM, move it to a physical box, reconnect it to the same data, and show that, no, it's not a, it's not a problem with the, uh, the VM, it's a problem with the Oracle stuff. We also work with our customers behind the, the scenes through TSNet to work out those situations. So um, I think right now, the only thing, that, again, that it's bought Oracle um, besides ill will from their customers is a lot of people trying Oracle VM because they, they want to try to avoid it, but most folks will end up on another virtualization platform. You know, so you know, DreamWorks is actually running some of those uh, 32, no, I don't think they're running any 64 virtual CPU boxes, uh, VMs, but they are running 32 virtual CPU VMs because again, for some of their key um, virtual uh, key database servers, they needed those extra um, those extra CPUs for that. Uh, an example of Unix to Linux migration, this is in Europe, um, Cordal Consors, it's a division of BNP Paribas. Um, they were moving off of uh, WebLogic, which was hosted on Solaris Zones, hosted on Solaris on Spark. So, of course, when, when Sun was bought by Oracle, um, Oracle came to them with a great deal um, on, on moving to the latest platform. They decided they really wanted to move um, to open source technologies. Um, so they, they, they chose JBoss first. So this was not led by virtualization. It was, you know, how do we get the benefits of what, what Oracle and Microsoft and others uh, tout for a single vendor stack where, where you have a single throat to choke or a single hand to shake for anything that goes out on that uh, platform. But we want to have the flexibility, you know, if we wanted to, to, to change out from JBoss to JBoss.org, we could do that. If we wanted to go from RHEL to another, to another Linux or, God forbid, to Windows, we could do that. Um, and if we wanted to switch from, from Rev to VMware or other platforms, we could do that as well without disrupting the technology. But if we chose all the Red Hat technologies, we got the benefit without the lock-in. So that's how they chose to, to move. Um, they saved a huge amount of money. Um, they actually finished their project ahead of time, and now they're serving up to a million customers a day checking their bank balances um, using this platform. And then I mentioned Qualcomm, um, probably the largest North America customer of VMware. Um, they've, been slow, they've been quietly updating their story with us every year at Summit um, uh, and at our launch events. But essentially, they started off deciding that from a strategic level, they didn't want to be locked into VMware. They were already at about 50 to 60% virtualization. 
but they could see, look, you know, they could look towards the future and didn't want to wake up one day and all of their infrastructure was wedded to a single vendor. They dual sourced their hardware, they dual sourced their applications, they, didn't, they wanted a similar uh, ability on the virtualization side. They chose Rev because of its basis on open source technologies. They started off with net new Linux workloads, so that's kind of what this, uh, this shows here. They actually developed their own user portal before we put together a user portal, so they used our API to, to, to call and do the automations. Now they've actually stopped um, deploying net new VMware licenses. In fact, they decided not to renew their ELA. Um, they're putting a lot of pressure on VMware. They didn't like the way the VRAM thing rolled out, um, as a lot of customers didn't. Um, so now they're actually deploying, um, they're moving Linux workloads off of VMware to free up space for Windows workloads, because that's their preferred platform for the Windows workloads, and putting them on net new rev. Um, they're even starting to play around with some Windows on, on Rev because, again, Rev, although we host Linux, um, is fully SVVP certified by Microsoft. So all of the operating systems that are supported today under that program, plus most of Microsoft's server applications, come under that program. Um, for those of you who are interested in virtual desktops, um, some people are, some people aren't. It's a technology that's built into the product. So we don't have a different management solution for, for desktops. You do have to buy an add-on for support of desktop operating systems. So that's a, um, again, our costs uh, there are very competitive, um, but that's just for that particular use case. Um, so an example here is a mining company in Europe. Um, they wanted more data security, but actually, you know, the biggest thing for them was that they have PCs and mines. And you can imagine that in that environment, a uh, $1,000 or $2,000 PC doesn't last very long. Um, so they wanted to use very thin, very cheap endpoints, but still give users a full user experience, even though they're down in the mines. And if they had to replace something, it's only a $400 thin client. Um, they tested out VMware's v PCOIP. They tested out um, RDP Remote FX. They tested out Citrix, um, ICA HDX and they ultimately choose, chose Rev and the SPICE protocol, which is our secret sauce for, for, for desktop deployments. So um, the other thing that I'll mention here is that we're the only um, provider who through the same interface will give you both Windows and Linux desktops. So in addition to, you know, sort of the, these, these folks are doing Windows desktops, we also have a lot of folks who are doing, um, uh, who are hosting development, uh, you know, developers who need to develop on multiple Linux uh, desktops for multiple Linux ver versions, plus maybe Windows to do their email, they can do that all from a single interface. Other things that our customers are doing um, at hardware refresh time, um, you know, how, how many of you have those uh, great Unix or Linux boxes that seven years later just run, you don't want to touch them, you don't want to recertify them, certainly don't want to replatform them. But hey, Sandy Bridge is out, and RHEL 4 won't even boot on Sandy Bridge. Um, you can do a P to V without replatforming it, put it on Rev. You gain access to a lot of the performance, not as much as you would if you had a RHEL 6 guest running on, on Rev 3, but you'd get a lot more of it than you do if you could run it on bare metal, which sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, but you gain access to that new hardware. You keep it on the same version of Linux, so you don't have to replatform. Maybe you don't have to do as much recertification. And you've still got a lot of room to grow on that new hardware. So um, for those of you who are on, you know, if you, if you keep that old box around, it gets increasingly more expensive. It's a drag on your, on your IT budget to have to keep a five-year-old box in service. Why do that when you can just virtualize? Um, test dev, again, with user portal. Um, the vSuite that came out at VMworld is targeted towards this use case, but that's a very expensive proposition. Um, it's either Enterprise Plus or it's one of these, these new suites that, that costs a lot. Um, if you fit the use case of what the user portal can deliver today or in 3.1, you can get that test dev kind of thing going there. And then I'll mention two other, I've already talked about the Unix to Linux migration. Um, SAP and other mission critical workloads. Um, SAP recently did a tech paper where they showed 
um, that ability to do 64 virtual CPUs may not matter for you know, a DHCP box or a, or a Postgres server, but it can mean a lot in an SAP environment. So they showed that compared to what uh, vSphere 5's maximum at the time was, which was 32 virtual CPUs, having the ability to address more virtual CPUs gave them a 20% performance boost on the same box. Um, so a lot of these hard to move or hard to virtualize uh, things are now starting to move just because all of the hypervisor technologies have caught up to their capabilities. Um, we have the advantage of our roadmap for, um, for KVM follows the Linux kernel roadmap. So I know that VMware has a lot more engineers working on their kernel than we have working on KVM, but we have about the same number of engineers working on the Linux kernel worldwide. So uh, we got a uh, we have a lot of momentum behind us there. And then finally, for those of you in the public sector, um, Rev bakes in a couple of technologies called SE Linux and SVirt. Um, this is a security mandatory access control that's built into the kernel. So unlike other platforms where it'll allow a fault or a, an access problem to occur, and then you have to try to roll it back or contain it, um, SE Linux and SVirt define uh, mandatory access control at the hypervisor kernel layer. So if, it, if it's not allowed to happen, if it's not on the whitelist, if this VM is not allowed to talk to, to this data store, then it just doesn't happen. So that technology is, is uh, uh, that's, that's with my marketing speak on. Um, you know, there, there are some, uh, some tweaks to that. Um, but uh, this is, you know, we have public sector customers who, for example, have been unable until now to deploy virtualization in their DMZ because of security requirements. And because of SE Linux, which is the technology they're used to auditing on the, on the security side, they already have uh, technologies in place for that. Um, they actually use a full version of RHEL, which is more addressable than our Rev H, um, but is still supported by Rev, so that they can customize the SE Linux security policies. So, so you know, the, the question is, can, you know, does, do these technologies help to keep a, keep a VM from escaping yeah. either into the hypervisor or into another VM? Yeah. Um, the, the way that the, the technology is set up today, um, it, the answer to that is yes. Um, we've actually run tests where, where we have a VM and we introduce malware that, that will attempt to not only just take over the, the, the VM, but will also try to take over the, um, the hypervisor and other VMs adjacently as well. Um, the the SVIRT and SE Linux security policies are enforced with technologies like C groups and other things that are in, in RHEL 6. Um, so we're fairly confident. I mean, you, you can look at our, our list of bugs that are, that are uh, or, or CVEs that are uh, addressed every day. A lot of our concerns are on security of bare metal Linux as well as, as KVM. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that as a Red Hat subscriber you pay for is that, you know, we're not just giving you the open source technology, but we are working in our intrusion detection groups to find those issues with um, both Linux and these particular security um, uh, technologies. So, you know, is there a zero day exploit somewhere for, for some of these technologies? Probably. Um, does SE Linux and SVIRT and C groups make it a lot harder to, to architect something like that? Yes. Um, and um, KVM is not like Linux containerization technologies where your kernel is shared among the guests. Each guest has its own kernel. Could be a Windows kernel, could be RHEL 6, RHEL 5, RHEL 4, Ubuntu, CentOS, something else. And there's a kernel for, for, the, uh, for the hypervisor itself. And these are all secured through these technologies. So we've mentioned all throughout this that Rev is based on open source technologies. Um, and Red Hat is one of the few players that does what I call a pure open source play, which is you may be familiar with Alfresco or other, other you know, Jive software, other companies that base their uh, technology on open source. They have a community edition, which is free. 
and usually has a lot less features and lags the enterprise edition. And then the enterprise one, which is they, what they pay, you pay for, it's technically not free in terms, of, in terms of you have to pay for it, but it also may include some proprietary code, it may include some stuff that um, is only the people who pay get. And whether any of that makes it back to the open source community is kind of questionable. Um, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization is based on two technologies. One is the Red Hat Enterprise Linux kernel itself. So that's our hypervisor technology. So KVM, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the kernel, all the device drivers, everything that's used to schedule virtual machines, that's part of our hypervisor. And for those of you who are familiar with Red Hat, we have our, our enterprise product, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but then we also have uh, our upstream, which is called Fedora. Um, and Fedora is where we do all of our development. It's where we try out new technologies, see what's, you know, throw it against the wall, see what sticks. Um, is ButterFS ready for the enterprise? Probably not yet, but you can play with it in Fedora. Um, we take the best from Fedora. Um, we pull it all together. We harden it. We make sure it works with IBM HP servers and Cisco hardware and it meets all the use cases of our customers, and then we ship it as RHEL. Um, we do the same thing with the hypervisor technology. There's an upstream KVM in Fedora. Um, there's upstream what we call the overt node, and I'll get to overt in a second. For the slim down hypervisor, it's based on Fedora, and that's what gets pulled into our hypervisor technology. We have a similar project for the management system. So the management server, the APIs, the load balancing engine, all of those technologies um, have been donated out to, by Red Hat to a, to a project called overt.org. Um, you can actually download overt 3.1 today. Um, it's not exactly what we're going to be shipping towards the end of the year, um, but very much like Fedora, it's, it's the usable, fully donated out, available for free version of the rev management system. We work on that project with individual contributors all over the world, but also with a lot of commercial partners whose logos are up there. So Cisco is obviously working with us on a lot of the networking technologies that we build into Overt. Intel um, is doing a lot of work with us on HBAs, 10 gigi, um, making sure that we can take best advantage of a lot of the new hardware virtualization enablement technologies, NetApp on storage, IBM on a uh, whole bunch of whole bunch of stuff, including uh, including KVM. We even work with SUSE and Canonical. Uh, I don't usually have those logos in my slides, but you know we work with them because they've donated um, engineering resources to the project to move it forward. Um, so Overt is kind of our fedora. We're going to play with it upstream today. Overt is very much, you know, it's ninety percent identical to Rev. We expect to see what happened to Fedora over time to happen to Overt. Overt will become the playground where we play with cool new technologies that may or may not be ready yet for the enterprise, may not be fully baked yet, but it's where you can play. Um, and then we take those and we harden them, fix the bugs, get them working on certified hardware, and ship them out as Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. Um, so this is, this is a lot of work in terms of you know, the coordination, but we think it's valuable um, because, again, we can't do it ourselves. Um, we, we want to have this, this really strong community um, of individual contributors as well as, as key partners who want to make Overt better. Um, and there's a, there's a marketing organization called the Open Virtualization Alliance, which is an even broader group of folks who are trying to drive KVM adoption overall includes IBM, HP, Intel, um, a lot of these other folks, but um, also individual ISV partners as well as some resellers um, who are, are dedicated towards getting open virtualization solutions out into the market. Question on uh, our relations with OpenStack. So um, we announced a couple of months ago um, that Red Hat is, Red Hat's been contributing to OpenStack, um, which is a public it's a public cloud project that is geared towards allowing folks to create their own Amazon EC2-like environment, whether it's as a, as a hosting provider or whether you know, you've been using Amazon for a while and you're using it so much now that the, 
the bills which used to be sort of, I could do them on my credit card are getting kind of scary. Um, and you want that capability inside your four walls. You want to pay for it. Um, so today, OpenStack, the Folsom release came out a few months ago. Um, no, sorry, the Essex release came out a few months ago. Folsom is coming out soon. Um, is a series of projects around a compute engine, a network engine, an image engine, um, so that you can build your own public cloud infrastructure. Um, we started um, getting involved about a year ago, and I think as of Essex, we're the number, one, number three contributor um, behind Rackspace and maybe NASA, I think, are the, the for, for top two. Um, and actually, our group in virtualization is, is managing that, that technology. Right now, um, we're, we're seeing that there's some interesting things going on there and a lot of momentum, a lot of contr contributions. But OpenStack, as it is today and will be tomorrow, is still kind of a, uh, a nice toolkit that you can combine with lots of hours of engineering time, um, maybe some consultants from Accenture, and you can build something over the course of a couple of months, um, rather than building it from scratch. Um, but we see a lot of potential in the technology, um, and that's why we're getting involved with it today. So um, we have a preview of, of OpenStack that will, based on the SX release, that will actually install on RHEL. Um, so if you go to redhat.com slash OpenStack, um, you can uh, sign up for that and try it out. Um, that was our first goal, was to get it to actually install through RPMs and through Yum rather than through apt-get on Ubuntu. Um, because a lot of our customers were starting to, uh, to play with OpenStack and said, you know, we really like the concept, we like where it's going, we don't want to run it on Ubuntu. We want a supported Linux to run it on. If we're going to bring it into our four walls, we want it on the same Linux infrastructure we have everything else on. So that was one motivator. Um, the second is there's just a lot of cool technology going on there. Um, one of the things we've already announced for, um, for RHEL 7, and, which is you know, about a year off, um, and Rev 4.0, which will come out right after RHEL 7 does, is we're going to be utilizing the Open vSwitch technology, which will come into the Linux kernel at that point, um, and we're going to be using the Quantum project from OpenStack to manage it. So, you know, there are, we, we intend to deliver an OpenStack uh, product next year um, based on Folsom, but it'll still be, you know, the pieces, parts so that you can put together your own cloud environment with consulting either from us or from a third party. Um, but we also see a lot of interesting things where, you know, we have the overt, uh, you know, the overt uh, folks um, are working on a whole bunch of projects that may overlap with some of the things that OpenStack does. If, if a better open source technology comes out to do something that we're paying engineers to do, our business model is to use what's, use what's available in the open source technology and then concentrate on doing the things that the open source tech community is not doing right now. So um, that's a long-winded answer to the, to the question, but uh, it's in preview today. There'll be a product for OpenStack tomorrow, and we think there's a lot of interesting synergies, uh, which is one of the main reasons we got involved besides our customers saying we want to install OpenStack on RHEL. Um, wanted to, to quickly review some of the cool stuff that's coming with Rev 3.1. Our uh, test environment today is with the latest version of Rev 3.0. So um, these, are, these are net new features. You won't see them today, but um, if, you, if you do a uh, uh, Red Hat or partner-led uh, through our, our partner's uh, evaluation of Rev, you can also try out the beta, um, which I think beta 2 just dropped of this. So we're, we're gearing Rev 3.1 towards the end of the year. Um, we haven't announced an exact date yet, but it'll be before Christmas. Um, so a couple of things that are happening behind the scenes. Um, we did a major move from Rev 2.2 to Rev 3.0. Rev 2.2, for those of you who aren't aware, was actually shipped on a Windows server and based on .NET technology, which is fine for the rest of the industry, but 
for, for a Red Hat product is, is ca causes cognitive dissonance. It's just a little, little odd. Um, so with Rev 3.0, we moved it to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 um, and based on JBoss EAP 5. Um, did require the Oracle Sun Java JDK. So with 3.1, we're moving to the Open JDK finally. Um, so we get, uh, again, fully, we're trying to fully open source as much as possible, um, so not requiring you to do extra click-through licensing agreements. JBoss EAP 6, which is a lot slimmer and starts up faster um, than EAP 5. Um, we're supporting two new LDAP directory servers, uh, Red Hat directory server and IBM Tivoli, um, in addition to uh, Red Hat Identity Management and Microsoft Active Directory, which are currently supported in 3.0. Our reporting engine is based on Jaspersoft, so we moved to the 4.7 release. So that's all sort of under the cover goodness, moving towards latest versions, more open source, more modular, um, slimming down the Rev Manager a bit. On the scalability, um, Rev 3.1 hypervisor will be based on RHEL 6.3 and RHEL 6.4. So guests go up to, I think I mentioned this before, 160 virtual CPUs per virtual machine and two terabytes of VRAM. Um, new support for Sandy Bridge and Bulldozer platforms, um, explicit support for those. So um, Rev 3.0 will run on those today, but can't take advantage of some of the net new um, processor hooks. Uh, new P2V tools, so for those of you who want to migrate either from existing vir uh, physical machines or from virtual machines that are hosted either on uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Zen or KVM, uh, ESX or other platforms, uh, we have a, a migration tools that, are, that come with Rev as well as uh, working with some partners. Our um, user portal today um, is restriction-based, but it doesn't have a concept of quotas on resources. With 3.1, it will. So with Rev 3.1, your users and administrators can also be assigned, in addition to permissions on objects and on, on actions, can be assigned a pool of, I give you 10 virtual machines, uh, 30 vCPUs, and 64 gigs of RAM. And once you run out of those, you've got to ask an administrator for more. Um, it also has the concept of, of tickets that you might be able to get for, for different things. So you may be working on Project X, and you have that initial uh, ability to create 10 VMs. But now you're working on Project Y. So in cluster, in cluster Y, I'm going to give you some more VM resources that you can create. So your effective permissions across different um, objects can be combined together. Um, so a nice, nice system there. Um, internationalization, so again, very important, I know, for, for those of us in, in, uh, in Quebec. Uh, French um, UI as well as Japanese, Chinese, Spanish, um, English is already there. As well, um, we're pub publishing out the framework for the languages out to the overt um, community. So we've actually got you know, some folks in, on the overt.org working on the Ukrainian UI. It's not something we're investing in yet, but you will be able to do that probably in overt first, and then we'll pull it into, into Rev later. A better task manager for um, when you're managing multiple ongoing tasks. Um, storage vMotion, which will be enabled in Rev 3.1, can take a long time. You know, it can take a couple of hours, depending on the bandwidth between your SANs. Um, what if you want to halt it? You know, you want to take the VM down for some reason and, um, you know, you, you ran out of time in your maintenance window, you can cancel a task from here. You can see everything that's going on and it's permission-based. So as the super user administrator, you can see everything. As a administrator with a smaller domain, you may not be able to see other people's tasks or manage them. A Linux command line interface. So those of you who love the white text on the black background can can do that with Rev. Um, so all of the operations that you'll be able to do through the GUI, you could do through the CLI. And if you really want to go crazy, Python SDK, uh, ready for Eclipse or whatever um, uh, scripting tools you want to use, uh, fully documented so that you can script more advanced uh, features and technologies. Networking, hot plug and unplug of virtual machine NICs will be supported. 
uh, storage, hot plug and unplug of disks, and a new UI for managing both disks that are attached to VMs, disks that are shared among VMs, uh, disks that are free floating, as well as external LUNs. So one of the other ways of mitigating the Oracle must, uh, must repeat it on bare metal um, is if you, have, if you have a direct LUN to your SAN that's hosting your, your data for your database and your VM is just, um, you know, just one of, of two or three in a load balancing cluster, one of those in the load balancing cluster could be on bare metal so that you would be able to reproduce on that bare metal box when you need it to. And you don't have to have it there all the time. You just have the ability, since you have the ability to share either a disk uh, externally or internally, you could have that as an option as well, rather than having to do a P2V. Um, shared disks, live snapshots, um, multiple storage domains. Um, so um, Rev3.0 um, uh, has a limitation where a VM has to have all of its disks from a single, uh, from a single SAN. But you may have a situation where you want the, the boot disk to be on uh, relatively uh, on, on one tier of storage. And maybe your data, because it's a database, has to be on your fastest SAN. Um, so now you'll be able to split those two. Um, similarly, you might have your, your, maybe your virtual machine is all uh, mostly workload and archiving. So your data disk, you want it on your SATA disks. Um, so you'll be able to do that through the interface. Storage live migration. Um, so the, the movement of um, this is regular vMotion is moving a running VM from one host, physical host to another. You're moving the compute and the memory, but you're not moving the storage. Uh, with storage live migration, you're moving the storage but keeping the VM where it is. Um, so this is a technology that will be debuting with Rev 3.1. Uh, when we first release, um, we'll be calling it a tech preview because there's some cool new features in RHEL 6.4, uh, which won't be released until February um, or thereabouts, um, that will enable it fully. Um, but it'll still be functional and supported um, in Rev 3.1 when it first comes out. And then you'll be able to do a hypervisor upgrade to get to um, the, the additional performance that we're looking at for that release. POSIX file system support. So today we support iSCSI, Fiber Channel, or NFS. Um, now we'll be able to support other POSIX file systems. We're starting off with IBM GPFS, for those who have investment in that. And of course, the Gluster file system, which is the uh, Red Hat Storage FS. Um, so you'll be able to attach to those to store your virtual machines as well. Um, we'll be doing a tech preview in Rev 3.1 of actually managing Red Hat storage from the same interface as your Red Hat Enterprise virtual machines. So um, today, Red Hat storage is command line based. Um, when Rev 3.1 comes out, you'll be able to uh, create storage nodes and manage them from this GUI, very similar to, to Rev. Um, and in our roadmap, we're looking at integrating the two so that you could, um, in a fully supported way, have perhaps nodes that do what everyone was hoping that VMware storage appliance could do but can't, which is to provide not just VM, uh, VM storage, but also generic iSCSI to your entire environment, rather than to just to your, your hypervisors. Um, a lot of that is upstream, um, hasn't been fully announced yet, but the starting of the integration between Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization and Red Hat Storage comes out with 3.1. Some VDI stuff that's coming, um, auto start of VM pools. Um, it's again, if you, if you have VDI solution, um, you'll be able to um, always ensure that, that there are VMs ready for people to log into. If you have a, a pool of 100 users, um, you want to make sure that 10 machines are already are ready to go, some WAN optimizations in USB. And then cool new stuff coming for, for beyond 3.1. Um, so again, one of the benefits of open source is our roadmap is out there. So look at Overt, um, look at our Summit website. There's a complete presentation on some of this stuff coming as well.